Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 155, we're going to talk about vinyl records as a high resolution analog source. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Now that all the Universal 6 or 12 SL7 kit phono preamps are on their way to test builders, my thoughts naturally turn to wondering what the first tracks are that they'll be playing. The very first music you play on a new bit of gear is always the most important. The reason for this is your brain has not yet gotten used to the sonics and probably has never heard anything quite like it before. That gives you a unique opportunity to make an early, quick assessment. Later on, after a week or so and lots of listening hours, you'll be able to make a second assessment. But by then, your ear-brain interface will have had time to adjust to the new sound. The title of this video is meant to get everyone thinking. What in the heck is he talking about? Vinyl records as a high-res analog source? Exclamation mark times three. <laughs> well, if you think about it, all records pressed prior to about 1982 were all analog. That's everything from the microphones to the studio console, tape recorder, overdubs, even splices were analog, made with sticky tape, all the way to the cutting of the lacquer, pressing of the record, and eventually to your turntable stylus, vibrating in the record groove following the original path of the cutting lathe. So even though great vinyl records can't equal the resolution of a DSD-256 or PCM-24 forward slash 192 digital file, they still are an excellent high resolution source. Now, you might have noticed a couple of props here. Mostly I just dropped these in so that you weren't staring at a white table with a nice texture cloth. <laughs> but recently um, I did some trading and I, I, I got a replacement for my wonderful Nagaoka MP110 cartridge. This is, if, if you're on a budget, this is by far the best deal. I think I paid uh, direct from Japan, 120 US dollars delivered, something like that. I bought quite a few of these uh, direct from Japan and, and replacement styluses. And this has got to be the most musical, best sounding budget cartridge ever made, in my opinion. And I've gone through a fair number of them because um, you know, the, the system is always in use and stubby fingers and uh, uh, accidents happen when you're using you know a system uh, during the working day it's not the same as taking your time uh, when when you've got uh, a relaxing weekend to play records anyways uh, I replaced it with an order phone 2m uh, bronze and I heard that first in my friend's system and it brought the bass alive the way the the uh, budget Nagaoka doesn't uh, it it had a lot better definition. In fact, the all the frequencies were all had a little bit better clarity and definition. And um, mus the musicality of the cartridge of the order phone, uh, it's different than the Nagaoka, but um, I would say it's it, it's it's close. I almost prefer the Nagaoka in that sense, but. Overall, I would say the bronze is definitely a big improvement. The other thing that I bought for my system when I got the 2M bronze in uh, was a, um, a loop um, magnifier. And this is a 40 times uh, 25 mil. And it's got a built-in light here. I won't shine that in your eyes. But I can tell you that... Um, this is, this is a must have. You've got to be able to magnify uh, the cantilever and, um, and the diamond or whatever your cut is. Um, 
I think almost everybody's using diamonds these days. Uh, I couldn't believe the um, the small things. They were stuck uh, right on uh, the stylus tip. But um, so anyways, uh, I highly recommend something like this. I've always relied on small magnifying glasses that probably only have, I don't know, five or ten times magnification. So uh, 40 times, wow, <laughs> you, can, you can clearly see the cut of the diamond, which is really kind of neat. Okay, well, through the magic of editing, let's drop in the music room and take a look at some records. Well, welcome to the music room. Um, it's not often we're actually facing this way. Behind me is uh, some of the record stacks, and um, let's just take a look at a whole bunch of records I've pulled from the collection. Uh, they're not in any particular order, but we'll talk about each of one of them. And really, the whole point of the discussion is to sort of get some orientation as to what to look for in a good sounding record. So this is, um, let's get you focused. There we go. This is Keith Jarrett's uh, most famous album. This is the Cone Concert. This is what got Keith Jarrett really rocking and rolling, selling records and selling out concerts. This also helped get ECM, the ECM label. Um, that's the edition of contemporary music. Got a I hate acronyms like that. I never remember what they mean. Um, but this is a um, this is a great sounding album. If you're into improvisational piano jazz, um, you will love this album. But and it's a big but. ECM uh, is a German label, and um, almost everything that they record is beautifully recorded. Um, with amazing clarity, uh, really good, full dynamics, but they, when they got bigger, they started pressing records outside of Germany as well as in Germany. So you want a German press. And um, a good friend of mine actually found a second copy of this, another German press, and he gave me his copy that had, you know, it wasn't as, as nice a looking jacket as the one he had found, but the vinyl is in amazing condition. So uh, ECM Records, uh, if you see that that label, and it's a German press, and you like modern jazz, uh, Euro jazz, um, scan jazz, uh, you're going to probably already know about ECM, but if not, grab, grab ECM um, music whenever you find it. It's not always to my taste. In fact, I would say most of it is is not my sort of jazz. Um, but the ones that that I click with, wow, you know, it's fantastic music. It can be fantastic music. Oh, I'm talking about um, uh, Euro jazz um, or scan jazz polarity. This is um, this is a brand new record. Wow. It's, it's not out brand, brand new, but it, by, you know, my timeline, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's a new record. It's on a label from, I think, Norway, 2L. Can you see it down? Yikes, don't. There we go. Or this camera has this focus po focal point. Anyways, it's 2L. It'll get back into focus. And um, they are they are digital records um, that are brought to analog, of course, to press. Once you, you know, once you're on the record, you're an analog waveform, right? Everybody knows that. But the source material is uh, digitally recorded, and it's an example of a modern digitally recorded track in high resolution that was pressed to vinyl that sounds great. That's not always the case. In fact, in most cases, uh, digital source material, even um, old source material, such as the master tapes for Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and I could go on and on, name every one of your favorite rock and prog rock groups that have been digitally transferred and then re-released as vinyl, they don't sound very good. And it's not surprising. Uh, it's a common problem. 
Unfortunately, the analog tapes um, are pretty much worn out now, which is why they're relying on digital transfers for pretty much everything they do going forward. They go back to the archived digital copy, and that's what they have to work with, even for remastering. So, uh, what to do if, if, you're, if you're a Zep fan? Um, well, go back to the original analog recordings. That's what you need to do, in my opinion. Same with Pink Floyd fans, um, and, um, and you won't be disappointed. Yeah, find the best press you can, and Bob's your uncle. Okay, what's next? This, by the way, is uh, the Hoff Ensemble, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and I was just at our local record show, and somebody had uh, two 2L recordings, uh, brand new, in the shrink, and he said he's got a guy who just gives them to him. Uh, I, I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense. But I snapped them up because what happens with a lot of um, audiophile recordings uh, is that they're, they're not made next door or in your own country and you have to import them. And by the time you add um, shipping costs, and uh, duties and or taxes to the importation, they become prohibitively expensive. So um, if you can find them at your local record store or at a record show, uh, they're often a much better deal than importing them yourself. Okay, what's next? Okay, this actually came from the same record show. And this is George Benson. Um, and uh, George might not be your cup of tea. Uh, he pretty much helped usher in what became known as uh, smooth jazz. And if, if, I'm at a, if I was at a party and somebody put smooth jazz on, I would, it would be time to go. <laughs> but in the early days of George Benson, he was really brilliant, in my opinion. And before he got into the, you know, the more s smooth side of jazz, um, and this is a great record. It sounds great. Um, and what can I say? I mean, uh, uh, oh, yeah, I can say it's on CTI. So that's Creed Taylor's label. And everything on CTI is, is well recorded. Uh, just like uh, ECM. You, and you might not always find the music that you like. Uh, this is another wonderful CTI, and this is Summer Jazz at the Hollywood Bowl. You've seen me uh, talk about this record. This is a live, there's actually three of these. The same day, it was sort of a, an afternoon festival kind of a ticket. The tickets are actually reproduced on the cover, which is kind of fun. And this was the CTI lineup of the time. It was it was an effort to promote the label, the artists, um, come out to the show and, and you know, hear what the whole thing is about because it was quite a unique sound, I think, for that time period. And, um, and Creed Taylor uh, really, you know, you, you, you could argue that his direction musically wasn't to everyone's taste, but the artists were all top notch. And he got uh, one of the best known mobile recording guys. And again, I'd have to pull out this whole thing and research it. It's, it's, he's actually on the inside here. They talk about who did all of the work. That's sometimes on better records, you'll see the engineers all named, um, often not, uh, but they did in this case. And uh, Charles did some research and it turns out he's the guy. He was the guy and um, as a result, we did some more research and we found other records that he worked on, that the mastering engineer worked on. And it, this wasn't an accident. These guys knew what they were doing. And that's a good bit of advice. When you find a great record, you can go deeper into it if you can find some of the um, credit information and often find other great records. In fact, I'm going to have to go. I'm, I'm going to be off camera for just a moment. Charles probably won't edit this out, and I want to grab a record that I completely forgot to pull. Okay, so 
I like to buy record collections. Um, it's probably the most affordable way to acquire records, and you find interesting things. Now, I'm not only am I interested in jazz, world jazz, prog rock, but I'm also very interested in classical music and um, buying collections for classical collectors is really the way to go because you can find some wonderful records for very little money. So in a recent classical collection that I bought uh, uh, from a lovely lady, a local lady who was just trying to find a home for her father's records, her mother's records, her records, and I think maybe even another sibling. So there was three or four collections all combined. And I knew it was mostly classical, uh, but she had said there were a few jazz records in the collection. And it turned out there was more than just a few, and quite a few rock and pop records. Um, and those will probably go into my next record show, if I have a next record show. I used to sell records um, part-time for fun. And, um, and if you've never sold at a record show, I'll tell you the secret of selling at a record show. Many of the vendors, not the big pros, you know, who make some serious coin, but the small guys like me, uh, go to record shows because the first half hour or hour before the doors open, the record vendors are setting up and you can wander around and get first pick. Yes, first pick. <laughs> and I found some amazing deals that way before the public gets to go in. So um, everybody who goes to as a dealer brings tons of cash because you might have spent hundreds of dollars before the doors even open. Anyways, just that's a pro, a pro tip. <laughs> so uh, in that collection that I bought, there was a compilation called The Bass and it's punched. Let me see if I can find the punch. Somewhere on here it's been punched. It's a box set, it's three records, and um, it's, uh, it's an ABC Impulse. Now, we were just talking about CTI and Creed Taylor. Well, before Creed Taylor started CTI, he started Impulse. And uh, the guy really had his chops. Um, I hope he's still around. I hope he can he picks this picks up this video because nobody talks about um, the quality of recordings that he put out there. But the the quality of this compilation um, called the bass. There's also one on the saxophone and the drums. And Charles did some research and he said I've got we've got copies available, so we've got them coming in as well. I don't know if they'll be as good as this compilation, but this is basically going back through the vaults of Impulse recordings and presumably looking for recordings that, um, you know, are lesser known or haven't been released yet, but I'm not sure. But anyways, the recording quality is amazing. Um, it's, it's straight up jazz uh, from the uh, late 60s, early 70s, and it's just it's just amazing. The, the records are just, and I think this is actually, I'm not sure if this was the first or second press. We're, always look for the earliest pressing you can find and closest to the master tapes. So um, I'm not sure if Impulse was in New York or LA, but in the US for sure. Um, so you want a U.S. pressing, but you also want the earliest U.S. pressing you can find because that'll be as close to the master tapes as you can get, unless you've got, you know, a brother-in-law who has access to the master tapes. <laughs> no. Back in the day, there were, people were making dupes, um, not very legal dupes. These days, those master tapes, they're in vaults, so <laughs> forget about that idea. Anyways, um, that's a great compilation. And you can find compilations in particular, um, even though they don't fit in a collection sort of naturally in the sense that you can say, okay, well, that's a Duke Ellington. That goes under D or E. However, I file under Discogs rules, which is whatever the first letter is, unless it's an A or a, a T from a the. So Duke Ellington goes under D in my collection. Um, but uh, those compilations can be fabulous deals. I mean, really, the biggest cost of buying most compilations is the shipping. 
So, and that came in the collection I bought, so there was no shipping. Here is one of my favorite um, artists, Anwar Braham. He's, in my opinion, he's one of the greatest uh, modern jazz composers, performers, and he refuses to come to North America. Uh, and I refuse to spend the carbon uh, credits and fly all the way to Europe. So uh, this is as close as I can get to him. This is also on ECM and the recordings are extremely good on digital. This is a later record of his, almost certainly recorded in digital and then pressed to analog vinyl. And it's not as good as the digital recording. I bought it because I just have to have everything by it and more that I can find. Uh, I have the digital version of this and that's what I listen to, unfortunately. And one of the big problems with, um, with recordings that were done digitally and released digitally is that they never thought that they would have to press them on vinyl because, you know, vinyl was in the past. So they weren't worried about fitting things on record sides. So you end up with, you know, two and a half, sides of a record or something like that so you end up with odd cuts and break anyways it often it does not work well and th in this case it didn't work it's a beautifully pressed record the, everything about it is absolutely gorgeous but the sound is it's a bit flat it's a bit digital up next there's a digital record from back in the day now this is a phillips recording this is, um, this is a Haydn uh, uh, record of the seasons. And this is one of his last, certainly I think his last major uh, compositions. And I think it's on three, three records and it's glorious. And Phillips, um, Phillips was, was uh, and is, but back in the day was huge. They would have been pretty much the equivalent of so the, what Sony is today, but better sound quality. Um, Philips made, Dutch Philips made amazing record pressings. They focused on mostly classical. Classical was the gold standard back then. Um, if you're a record collector or a serious music lover, you had to be, uh, you know, serious about your your classical music, and it's not for everybody. Um, I happen to be a collector. I go, I have seasons tickets to our local symphony, uh, but I also go to our local jazz club and to, you know, other things. Uh, great music is great music, in my opinion. Um, now, back in the early 1980s, when um, digital came in and the CD uh, was released to the public, uh, everybody started recording in digital, obviously, and um, Philips, and I think in combination with EMI, uh, developed their own system, the, the whole analog to digital conversion. And it is superior, in my opinion, to almost anything I've ever heard since. And they proudly call these digital re records. And in most cases, if you see a digital record from that era run <laughs> and if you happen to have it you can you know i always give a record two two seconds three seconds before i chuck it even if i think it's going to be garbage but these uh early phillips and i think the emis uh that are digital records they sound very analog they're extremely clean they have great dynamics the pressings are amazing now the uh, Phillips, the regular Phillips lineup of analog records are just as good and sound very much like this. And I can highly, if you can find music that you like on a Phillips pressing, and that's the big problem. A lot of the Dutch Phillips recordings are really not to my taste. Um, and, but the, the orchestras, the soloists, oh my God, they are world-class. I can't say enough about it. And this is a, an example of how um, digital recordings can sound great on vinyl. Okay, now this is probably most people's favorite jazz record, though some people it's not really their cup of tea. Everybody knows Kind of Blue. This is, in my opinion, the definitive 
copy available currently. This is the Analog Productions. And now, Analog Productions does nothing but take analog master tapes, um, either vintage, you know, original tapes or whatever the closest they can get to the uh, original tape is. Sometimes they have to use a safety or a backup tape. Uh, and they actually have a recording studio now in which they're trying to capture um, older blues artists and other artists before they pass, get them in uh, on high quality uh, recordings. Because a lot of, 99% of all recordings ever made are really, they're not very good. And so uh, I, what Analog Productions is doing I, I'm 110% behind them. This is a great, it's 45, double 45 RPM. It's a great, great sounding uh, modern analog to analog to analog record. But recently I got really lucky at our local record show and i get you in focus here. And I found an original US first press. Now it's a bit noisy. Um, but it's, it's overall, it's in very good shape. And, um, and I never thought I would find an original 1959 press. And I think it's a fairly uh, early press off the stamper. Stampers get worn over time, so the, the music gets muddy. So if you've got what you thought should have been a really good record that doesn't sound very clear, it's got some ticks and pops that are really probably were pressed into the record, then you probably got an old stamper near the end of its life. Um, but if you got one that's fairly early in its life, then you might have, you know, got a real gem. And this is a real gem. It plays beautifully. Uh, it is noisy at, at times, uh, but not distractingly so. But it allowed me to compare this to the Analog Productions version. And this is every bit as good. If you could get rid of that surface noise, it would it would equal the uh, reissue uh, that was made almost 60 years later, I think. So imagine that. So you can still find uh, original presses that are playable, um, and locally even. Uh, no, it's not. This is not a cheap record, but it wasn't that expensive. Anyways, we've, we've run out of records. So, um, and I'm fading to nothing. <laughs> no, I'm back. So what do I want you to take away from our little record chat? Get the best pressings you can, all analog. So if it's a new record that's just been issued and it's a quality record, they will tell you on the record that it is an analog tape source, an analog mastering, and an analog um, transfer uh, to the lacquer, the, the actual cutting. So that's A, A, and A. If there's a digital somewhere in there, they might go AAD or ADA or, or DDA, something like that. What you really want to see is those three A's on it. If they don't say, it almost certainly comes from a digital source. Just don't spend your money on those. It would, you would be better off listening to the CD or streaming online digitally, uh, or have a digital download, and then wait. If it's something you really, really want, um, then either look for something from one of the companies that does um, uh, reissues, quality reissues like Analog uh, Productions. Um, and there's there, there's at least a half a dozen great companies out there doing stuff like that. Um, uh, or try to find uh, a, a, an early press, um, as close to the master tapes as you can find. Well, Charles is off sick today, and he, he had a couple of wisdom teeth removed yesterday. And if you're watching this, he's, been, he's well enough to do the editing. So uh, he should be back up and running, hopefully, in a couple of days. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valsenmore, signing off. Cheers, everyone.